Today we're going to be in Psalm 42, and this psalm is one of, I mean, I know I say this a lot, I just love the Bible, you guys. This is an amazing psalm, and many of you have sung the song that this psalm begins with. So we're going to pray, we're going to get into God's Word. Hey, would you join me in prayer, and we'll see what God decides to do today. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your Word. Lord, I pray, I pray that today we would find comfort in you. I pray that today, those of us in a dry season, those of us who have been in the desert place, those of us who have felt far from you, that, that we would be drawn close by your power, by your love, by your mercy. And Lord, I pray today that you would push out of our minds things that would lead us away from you, and that you would fill our minds with your word, that you would fill our hearts with your spirit, that you would change our lives that you would change our relationships, that you would grow within us an unrelenting, never giving up type of faith. I thank you for this psalm, Lord. Be with us now. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's kids said, amen. So Psalm 42, I'm going to read the first line, and, um, and then I'm going to ask just to see how many of you guys know this song. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Anyone know that song? Okay, I'm just seeing which um, denominations we have here today. It's, if you don't recognize it, it's that it's slow. As the deer panteth for the water, so my... See, you guys know that. That's all of the people who went to youth group in the 90s, you guys. That's it. We just nailed you right there. Um, and it's so nice, and it's so piano-y and keyboardy. But it's a deer that's dying. Okay, we're going to keep reading first, so we, it all makes sense. I'm going to start back in verse 1. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants. These are not pants you wear. This is thirsting. Pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. This is a key verse in this psalm and the next. Why are you downcast? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. We'll stop right there. Now, for me, um, one of the reasons I love preaching is because I am forced to go into this book deeper and deeper every single week. One of the reasons I don't like preaching is because when you read books like this, when you read a psalm like this about being in a dry place, guess where God tends to often take you? Right into the dry place. So when I preach uh, about dryness, when I preach about depression, when I preach about angry anger, when I preach about marriage, which I try not to do as often as possible, because when I preach about how loving husbands should be, guess who is the biggest fool in the house that week? Me. So when I'm preaching about this dry place, I need you to get in your mind this picture of a deer. Now, Deer are pretty smart animals, aside from when they jump across the street in front of cars. Deer, uh, they know where to find water. And growing up my whole life, I didn't have deer where I grew up. There's no deer just roaming down uh, the, the I-5 in Southern California. There's no deer in Los Angeles. There's no deer uh, in Hawaii. But there's deer here. And you guys, I love the deer here. Now, I think they're big because I didn't grow up around deer. Apparently, these are baby deer that are here. But every once in a while, when I'm going home, I like to drive out the back way, out on Boyette and Rodine back roads where there's cow pastures, because I didn't grow up by cow pastures. And every so often, usually on Monday nights, I don't know what the deer are doing on Mondays, but I'll be driving out on a Monday night, and then I see a little head and the beady little eyes looking in the road at me, and I speed up because I want to see a deer, because I don't see deer very often. And I'm, I'm really bad around deer. But here's what I know about deer. When they see me coming, they bounce. They're fast. They know where to go. 
They know when danger is nearby. They know how to find a secure, safe place. So a deer that is panting for flowing streams, this is not a deer that's just out of breath. This isn't a deer that just ran a 5K. This is a deer that went to the watering hole, and the, where the water normally was, it wasn't. This is a deer that knew, okay, if I don't get water, something bad is going to happen. Now, in our culture, we have water that's very plentiful. Some areas of the world, they don't have that. But some of us, um, I've seen you guys, some of us can't even go from one meal to the next without, quote, unquote, dying of hunger. And this is the culture we live in. Like, I've been sitting with people at places like Beef O'Brady's, and they get in there, and you, what do you do? You sit down, you get your Sprite, and then the server comes up, and they take your order, but because it's right after church, and we get out later than the Methodists, we're always late, and then all of a sudden, you're there, and your friend says this, oh, I'm dying of hunger. Do we ever mean that here? I mean, maybe you've lived somewhere where you did mean that, but here now, I've never been dying of hunger except for my own free will that I would do that. I've never had a moment where, uh, in my adult life where I didn't have opportunity to have food. So I I've only understood plenty. Most of us here, when we read this, we're not going to understand what it means to die of thirst. The closest that we can come is the recent storm that knocked out power, knocked out water. And if you were anything like me, you were the last person to the Walmart parade. So by the time you get there, you go to find water, and all they have is like cream of corn soup for days. And I thought, I, are we going to make this? Now, obviously, we, we made it because it was only one night here, and my kids had the best time of their life, and I, we all had 17 cases of water after. By we all, I mean you and not me. So what does it mean to be thirsty for God? What does it mean, and how do we thirst after God? Because this, this psalm, it haunts me because I, I have this sneaking feeling that we don't know what it means to thirst after God. That we're okay with just a sip of God. We're okay to just have enough God to get us through today. But what would it look like if we had such a thirst for God that we could not get enough? Now, the, the writer of this psalm does something very good for us because one thing we have to understand is that no matter who you are, if you're on a spiritual journey, you will go through a dry time, no matter who you are. Now, this presents a problem. Um, in the Psalms, we have Psalms where the psalm, psalmist knows, I did something wrong, therefore I am in a bad time. But this psalmist doesn't say that. This psalmist just starts off saying, I am thirsty, I am dying, I'm forgetting. God, you've forgotten me, what is going on? So we have to know that there will be times in your life where you will go through a dry place. You will go through a desert season. And if you're a newer believer, you, ha you have to understand that this is coming because if nobody tells you that a dry time is coming, then when it hits you, you'll be bombarded with doubts that you won't know how to deal with. If you don't know that a dry time is coming, and if you think that Christianity is only the good, easy, nice times, then when you get hit in the desert place, you'll wonder what is going on. Now, this is uh, really to blame on those of us who have been walking with the Lord for a long period of time. So if you've been walking with the Lord for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, um, we are often to blame for giving other people a misconception about Christianity. Because we share the, go the good news of Jesus, we say, hey, come to Jesus, it'll make your, li your life will get better. Did anyone ever come to Jesus and their life didn't get better besides me? I came to Jesus and it was really hard. I came to Jesus and I didn't know the rules. So it became very frustrating for me. But we just tell people, you come on in, your life's going to be okay if you just come to Jesus. Well, yes, your eternal life will be okay, but sometimes, sometimes the life here and now gets hit by a freight truck and you didn't see it coming. Sometimes when you come to Christ, you begin to lose things and you're wondering, why is it that when I give my life to Jesus, all of a sudden I lose this and I lose this relationship, I lose this money, I lose all of these things that used to give me meaning. Well, it's, it's important to know these things because as, as we who are older followers of Jesus, if you've been following Jesus for more than 20 years, we just need to tell people the actual good news of Jesus. Hey, come to Jesus, train wreck. Come be a train wreck with me. We are train wrecks together but God loves us, his train wrecks. And your life might get more wrecked, but God will be more there because God will meet us in the valley. This is the good news of Jesus. It's not come 
and be as good as I am, because if that's all the bar of Jesus is, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. We're setting ourselves up to find ourselves in the desert place. If we play the compare and contrast version of Christianity, we will always f- see people that are better than us and worse than us, so we'll always feel inadequate because we're not as good as them, but then when they're not around, we'll feel superior to those below us. And what happens with this constant comparison is, is you're going up and down, and then all of a sudden something hits your life, and you begin to blame God. God, why aren't I like them? Why don't I have the things they have? Because God's not comparing you to them. God's not comparing you to the person in the valley or the person on the mountaintop. God's got you in your own journey. And when you hit the desert place, it's good to find someone who has been there with you, someone who has panted for water before, someone who has thirsted. So when you get into the desert place, here's some um, good news for you. Does anyone ever hear voices in their head besides me? Maybe not. Okay, I hear voices in my head. You can call a therapist for me. I don't mind. As long as you pay for it, I'll go. I'm pro-therapy. I think we're all messed up enough to need a good good talking out of our problems. The uh, the writer of this psalm talks to himself. So if you didn't catch it, here's what he says in verse 5, or what they say, the sons of Korah. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again... Praise him, my salvation and my God. I love that the Bible gives me freedom to talk to myself. I talk to myself all the time. I talk to myself in the car. I talk to myself in the shower. I talk to myself when I'm going to bed. I talk to myself when I wake up. In this psalm, the writers give us a clue on how to get out of the dark place. Because here's what's happening. The head knows what's going on here. I know that God is good and with me and here but his heart doesn't know. His soul doesn't know. So the the writer is saying, okay, soul, he's talking to himself, inner dialogue. Why are you down? Hope in God, because I will again praise your name. Did you hear me, soul? I, I love this. I love this because so many of us don't do this. When we have a problem, we turn to something else. We turn to some other hope. This writer says hope in God because he knows his soul has been hoping in something else. I am notorious a hoper in something else. I hope in ice cream. I hope in sushi. I hope in bacon. I hope in late night snacks. Whenever I'm having difficult times, I know I'm the only one obviously in here that does this. I turn to everything except for God until I finally, I've eaten three quarters of a cheesecake, two beers, and a Cuban sandwich, and it's 1230 at night. And I think... I should probably pray. Because my soul, when I'm dry and downcast, begins to look for some hope and something, that I will get some relief from something. So I turn to those things so quickly without even thinking. Uh, As many of you know, please pray for my wife. She's been very, very ill. She's been in bed for like 90% of the past nine months. Or uh, nine months, oh my goodness, that'd be torture for me. (laughs) For the past month, just four weeks, nonstop, in bed, nauseous, sickness. There's no pill that I can get in her that makes her stop being sick. And in in this, in this, I'm uh, I'm hiding a lot, okay? So I was hiding because my in-laws lived with me um, for a while, so I'd hide up in my office, like the Grinch. And then my in-laws moved out, but my wife is so sick, I just hide downstairs from my wife because she's sick, and I feed the kids mac and cheese. We've had mac and cheese for like 17 dinners in a row now. Um, and, and what I'm doing is I, I just can't do it anymore. I feel like a bad husband, so I'm downstairs, and I'm like, God, you got to do something. You, you got to get my wife out of this funk. I, I just can't even, I can't even uh, be near her in the bathroom anymore. I can't touch her in bed. I can't wiggle in bed. I have been sleeping like a vampire at night, you guys. This is my confession, my therapy. When I go to bed at night, if I move, it can set off the nausea thing. So I'm in bed at night like, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> and if I'm thirsty, I have to think like, am I thirsty enough to make my wife have to, you know, be nauseous and go to the restroom and blah, blah. And so I'm waiting. Some nights I'm there and I'm licking my lips. I'm parched. I just got it. My water's right there. And I just reach over. I need to get one of those uh, Tempur-Pedic beds or I need to do this like leave it to beaver where we just sleep on two singles for the rest of this pregnancy. But I'm I'm crying out. And I've I've told God, I said, God, I, I don't know. I just don't feel 
good about this. I want my wife to feel better. The baby's okay, and that's great, but God, is my wife going to, like, make it through this thing? And then I start to get downcast, cast down, in turmoil. So this week I've been talking to myself a bunch. This week I've been trying to answer the question, when my head knows something that my heart doesn't get, what do I do? How do we get the knowledge we have up here through this little pipeline into my heart and soul? That is the biggest, most difficult journey that happens in all of Christianity. Billy Graham said the most difficult road to travel is from the head to the heart. That's it. And, and we know these things. We, we have all these books. Most of us know so much of this book that it would make Christians in other countries that don't have Bibles it would make them wonder, how are you still in such shambles when you have so much knowledge? We have a different problem here than they have there. They get one scrap of the Gospel of John, and they devour it. They memorize it. They commit to it. They think about it. They chew on it. I just got another Bible this week. I've got at least no less than 16 Bibles in my house right now. And I, I eat the Bible, and it, I just feel more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge but I can't get these things into my heart. I can't sometimes get into my heart the, the words and the knowledge and God's presence that is going to break through in addictions and struggling and depression. And why is that? And I have a theory. And this is a plumbing theory. I'm sorry for those of you who don't like plumbing theories. Um, I've got 3.3 children right now. Um, does anyone have, did anyone have a kid who just loved flushing things down the toilet? Okay, if you don't have one of those yet, pray that they stay far away from you and they belong to all of your neighbors and not you. Except for you, Amber, not my neighbor, you. Um, uh, because, because there's nothing worse as the dad when you hear the toilet is plugged. Because you don't know if it's DEFCON 1, like just too much toilet paper, or DEFCON 5, like a life-size My Little Pony that got down there somehow. You don't know if it's a Barbie leg or if it's just someone who was ill. So you go in with your tools, and I've got all the tools now because um, I'm fairly cheap. So I, you know, I get the plunger, I get the snake. I'm not going to call a plumber for this. I can do this myself, is what I tell myself. And I go in. And, and some of the time, I just got to clean out the toilet paper because before I taught my daughter how to count squares, when I just said, just, you know, take care of yourself, because that's my goal in parenting. I've got two goals in parenting. One is teach my kids to wipe themselves, and the second goal is kick them out of the house. Um, it doesn't have to be in that order, but it's going to happen. And in that parenting moment, I know some of you were like, wait a second. No, you're tracking. In, in that moment, though, I realized when you put too much stuff in for a certain size pipe, it stops the flow of water. Some of us here today, we have too much stuff in here that we haven't been processing, so it's not making its way down to our heart. Now, the metaphor really fails because don't put crap in here. Following? But we have so much Bible knowledge, we have so many sermons, we have so many Bible studies, and we love it, you guys. We feel good about ourselves when we know more about the Bible, and it's not bad to know about the Bible, but if you're not applying it, if you're not exercising it out, all you're doing is just putting more things in, in this little one-inch thick pipe is saying, stop it. I need to process some of this. This is why I think the writer is saying to his soul, why are you downcast? The soul is getting reminded, hey, we know things that are true. You may not be sensing them yet. They, not, they may not be making their way from my head to my heart yet. But there is a God and we will hope in him again more than we hope in food, more than we hope in money, more than we hope in sex, more than we hope in career or fame or power. We will hope in God again. And we will again praise him. I think the way to do that, the key to unlocking that, is, is stopping and slowing down and saying, okay, I, let me think about everything I know. And am I being obedient to what I know? It's a very simple question. Um, I didn't count these. But this is like a small... But there's nothing breakable in there. This is a small way to be hands and feet of Jesus. Um, another small way to be hands and feet of Jesus is the pantry. This bag, this, see this box? Do you see how much food is in that box, you guys? How much food is in there? Niente. It's empty. Because we need more food. Now, I'm not saying you have to go buy food. If everyone brought food in next week, I would be pumped up. 
if everyone bought food and a five dollar gift card and you just put it on the basket man i'd be fired up but i wouldn't be totally fired up because what we need next is for you to be the hands and feet of jesus because that's just filling the pantry the reason we have the pantry is for you to go back to that shelf and take a bag you don't have to ask me you don't have to ask anybody you say, I know someone in need. I know someone who's struggling. I know, I know someone who can't pay a bill. I'm going to go just bless them with this because they can't pay their internet bill, their electric bill, whatever bill. I'm just going to go drop it off. And they're pre-made meals with a gift card inside so that they can have a meal for their family. Being the hands and feet of Jesus, exercising our faith, means that taking, take what you know and start working it out. I was at a birthday party last night, and um, I'm trying to eat healthy. And, uh, and I know my friend's going to give me a hard time for this, but one of my friends told me recently, he said, I can tell... Ryan, that you're gaining weight in your midsection. That's what he told me, my friend. I'm not going to tell you who he is. He's sitting right here, okay? Um, so I, th- I said, oh, it's on, man. It is on. So I'm eating like a rabbit. I'm like, pizza? No. No pizza for me. No beer for me. Give me lean protein, broccoli, and I'll just eat ranch on every other one. And I will even start exercising, this is how desperate I'm getting. I, I am working toward my 5K, you guys. A uh, little update on that. I can run one mile now without stopping. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's cool. And if my friends keep telling me that they, can, they see me getting heavier in the midsection, I'm going to be running 70 miles a day um, until I'm just, just as ripped as Michael Jordan was in his prime. Okay, this is what's going to happen. But, but in, this, in this, I'm learning something. I'm learning something very important that I've known about nutrition, but as with all of us, we have Google. We know what we should do, and we don't do it because pizza is more fun than grilled saltless chicken. We know that we should do the chicken, and it's a smaller serving than you think. When I say eat chicken, I don't mean go to Costco and you by yourself conquer the whole world's history. I mean you get your four ounces of chicken breast and your cup of broccoli that's steamed, and then you go and you exercise more. We all know this, right? It's common sense. But for some reason, when you do it, it's hard. Your couch looks comfortable anyways, but your couch looks more comfortable when you're lacing up your exercise shoes. Right? Right? Your, um, your, your alarm, you already hate it, but you hate your alarm more when it's set at gym time in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you mm, preach it. Because, because even though we know what's better for us, we choose what's not. The same is true spiritually. We know it's better for us to be the hands and feet of God. We know it's better for us to love our neighbor as ourself. We know the things we ought to do. We know the things we ought not to do, but we keep doing the things that we shouldn't do. But we say it's, it's just easier. And it, we have something going against us. When we try to exercise physically, or when we try to get physically in shape, the only thing going against us is our own laziness. When we try to get in spiritual shape, it's not just our laziness going against us, it's the very powers and principalities of darkness themselves. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but if you want to take an exercise or a class, this is 101 in spiritual warfare. Here's what you do. Day one, open your favorite magazine and start reading it. Just read whatever article's in there. A hundred ways to raise better kids, how to grow poppy seeds in Florida, whatever you're doing. Read your magazine and check what happens in your mind. You're just going to fly through that magazine, time of your life. Day two, open your Bible, the words of God, the presence of God in word format, and begin reading your Bible. Here's what's going to happen. It's not going to be the same as when you read Field and Stream the day before. All of a sudden... In your mind, everything in your life is going to bombard you. Every deadline you have, everything you have to do, every errand that's not run, every empty part of your refrigerator shelves is going to bombard you. When you read Field and Stream the day before, it's going to be a miracle of God, and your kids are going to play nicely and share with each other. When you start reading the Bible, your kids are going to go ballistic, like there's a civil war in your living room, and it's over a stinking Lego. Because there's a spiritual component to this. So not only will your mind say, we could do something that will be more entertaining, forces of darkness are going to say, oh, wait, you're going to spend time with God today? We're going to shut this down. And not only that, because we fought through that as a culture, as a Christian culture. Try going out and doing something for God outside of your house. You think it gets hard then? Or when you're just reading the Bible? Wait till you're going to serve the homeless. 
Wait, wait till you're going to go walk over and pray for your neighbor. Wait till that one day where you're just casually going over to a friend's house and you say, hey man, hey, how can I pray for you? And they break down because their life is falling apart. Or that time when you're like, hey, I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a bunch of clothes down to this ministry and we're going to give clothes to, to the people who don't have clothes for winter time. I'm going to collect jackets and take them down. That's the day that you get a flat tire. Or the time that you're going to go to that Bible study and you're going to go to a Bible study and that they're going to have a serve night. They're going to have a night where they do something to push back the darkness in this world. That's the night that you and your spouse get in the biggest fight of the year. Or as happened this morning, uh, one of the families walking in came in. I saw this little tyke. His lip was just three times bigger that day. He had like a Grinch lip. It just grew. And the mom said he kissed a coffee table this morning. Those only happen on Sunday mornings. Have you noticed that? My kids kiss coffee tables on Sunday mornings. They, they never kiss a coffee table on Monday when I could send them to school for the rest of the week. It's always when something with God is going to happen. So here's what we have to do. Remind your soul what your mind already knows, and then wait. This is what the psalmist does. He just says, soul, you're going to do this again. We're going to remember. Now wait. Waiting is the least favorite game that we play in this culture. That was 12 seconds. That was awkward. I've been doing this thing. I've done it to some of you. I've been doing this thing. It's called um, Plus Five, and this was initiated upon me, and now I'm returning this gift to others. It's a game I call Plus Five. And when I hug people, in my brain, I think, I'm going to add five seconds to this hug. It's a plus five hug. Because it happened to me, and it was so awkward. But my hug was like a plus five minutes, and it was really awkward because it was in Park Square. But, um, but, but now I've been doing it to people. Try doing this with someone that's not here today. The next person you see that's a friend, give them a plus five hug. See what happens. It is awkward. Some of you introverts are like, no. Here's what they'll do. Guarantee it, because I've been doing plus five now for two weeks. You will hug them, and they pull away. You say no. You don't say it out loud. You don't want them to know what you're doing. You just you don't let go. And after they pull away once, I've only had one person try to pull away twice, because here's what you do. They pull away, and you're, mm-mm. Then they do this. And I'm like, you're only at three seconds, baby. And then after three seconds, they, and they're trying to let me know. They're saying, Ryan, let me out of your armpit, because that's where I hug people. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh. Now, <laughs> this is important. A as we engage, as we go further than we think we need to go, as we hold on a little bit tighter than we need to hold on, as we do things that bring people closer to us. In these moments, something is going to be awoken in us. There's something that happens when you wait an awkwardly long amount of time. And I found that with hugging, at the end of the day, people actually think it's, you know, adorable or something. They're like, wow, this is like a real hug. And we're just waiting. I'm, I'm waiting for my baby to come out. These are the things I like because God says, oh, you're going to learn waiting? I'm going to make your wife pregnant. Now, I mean, God didn't, it's not Jesus in her womb, but I'm saying I have, I have to wait at least nine months or eight months now. I love uh, waiting, you know, engaged couples. They have to wait. High schoolers, the, when you get that senior year, I mean, you are waiting. And then as soon as you're done waiting, you realize I've got to wait another four to seven years, depending on your intellectual abilities. And then you get a job, and you've got to wait till you retire. And then you retire, and you've got to wait till you expire. But we don't like it, so we fill all this time up. We don't like to be in that moment where our, our mind can talk to our soul, because it terrifies us. We go from alarm to singing in the shower to music in the car to music at work to podcast in the car to TV on, to loudness of kids, to running around, to music at night, to bed. Some of us go to bed only with shows on in front of our face. We're so terrified to wait in the silence that our head 
is getting full of this knowledge that never makes it down the pipe to our heart. So talk to yourself this week. That's the goal. Tell yourself, why are you downcast, soul? Why are you in turmoil, soul? If you find yourself in a desert place, ask yourself the question, have I been putting a bunch of things in here that I haven't been praying and asking God to get down to here? Am I being obedient to what I know so that I can grow in the goodness of God? Now here's the good thing about this. This psalmist says, my soul thirsts for the living God. There's someone else who thirsted in the Bible on the cross. Jesus said, I thirst. There's another story in the Bible that's very famous where the woman at the well was there. The woman who had multiple men in her lives. And Jesus said, can I have a glass of water? And Jesus told her that he was the living water. Now this is something that is important because if we don't get this point, we blow the rest of Christianity. If you're in the dry place, your tendency is going to be to ask, what boxes am I not checking? Am I reading the Bible? Am I praying? Am I doing good things? Now those are all good, but they're not the ultimate thing. If you turn your religion into a checklist Christianity, you will process things wrongly. When you sin, for example, you'll do some sin, and either you'll just feel terrible about it, and you won't even go to God. Did you guys ever do that game, or is that just me? You sin, and you say, I can't even talk to God for a couple days, and you let a couple days go by, maybe one or two days, and then all of a sudden you feel like there's enough distance from whatever sin it was, and now you can say, okay, God, here I am. I'm sorry I confess. That's just me but I, I do this. Or maybe you're the person who you just minimize your sin because we don't want to be calling ourselves what we actually are. Now, these are the games we play with Christian. This is checklist Christianity. So we don't say, I'm a bad person. We say, no, I, I've done some bad things. We don't say, I'm a liar. We say, oh, I've lied a few times. We don't say, I'm a, I'm a pervert. We just say, oh, I struggle with this every so often because we don't want to call ourselves out for what we are. But the good news about the cross is that Jesus called us all out. He thirsted so that we would never have to thirst again spiritually. He died on the cross so that, so that now we have a place to leave our baggage. We have a place that when we fail, when we're in the desert place, we are free to doubt. We are free to say, God, I don't get it. I don't know. I don't understand. I feel lost. I feel dry. I feel alone. And we could finally be free in that moment. Some of you have not tasted that freedom in a long time. But I'll tell you, the greatest freedom you can have is the freedom of thirsting for God to the point of death. Because when you're at the bottom, you've got nothing else to lose. When you sin and you know right where to bring it, you've got nothing to be ashamed of anymore. When you feel guilty and you know where you can nail that guilt, you can walk freely in the loving presence and saving grace of God. The reason that Jesus thirsted was to give you living water, was to give me living water. The reason that Jesus was far from God in a desert place and tempted by the devil in the desert is so that you could have someone who overcame the temptations of the devil on your behalf. This is the reality of life as we know it. So turn to God this week. Speak to your soul. And when you're in the desert place, ask yourself, is the stuff in my head making it down to my heart? And if not, then wait. Give God a plus five this week. Hold on to him and just wait. Because those who wait on the Lord will not grow faint or weary, but we will rise up on wings like eagles. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the good things that you have given us. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of the desert place you are there now, God, I ask that your presence would change us, that you would help those of us who are caught in the dry and weary walk, that you would help us wait, that we would wait awkwardly, that we would wait in the silence, that we would give you a plus five embrace this week. Lord, I've been, uh, I've been tired and dry. I've been uh, struggling in hopelessness in some areas. Thank you for for being faithful when I'm not. I thank you for being present even when I run and try to be far. Lord, we pray for the kids that are going to get these boxes, that, that they would feel your presence and know you. 
that they would come to know Jesus this week, that they would be prepared to be loved by uh, the Chapel family in this community. I thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.